first. So I'll say it again. Seek first. Seek first. That is the theme of RN17. And if you've never been here before, we are going to tell you what that means. We don't just come up with themes that look good on t-shirts or fashion shows. We go to God with what we believe he wants to say to a generation of young people from across this continent. And we believe God was speaking to us to encourage all of you guys tonight and for the next three days that there is nothing greater in your life than seeking God first. And we're going to go straight into Matthew chapter 6 tonight, which is a passage of scripture many of you have heard. And if this is your first ever time at something like this and you're like, Man, what is this? For the next four hours, I'm going to, no, not four hours. I'm going to next half an hour, we're just going to open this word of God and we believe that this is going to help your life. We believe it's going to do something in your life and we speak from the Bible in every session because the B-I-B-L-E, it is still the book for me. And so if you've got your own Bible, you can get it out. Or if you've got you version on your phone, you can use that. And if you've got neither of those two, then we have a massive Bible on the screen here. It says Matthew 6, reading from verse 25. This is Jesus speaking. How do I know that? Because it's in red. And it says, therefore, I tell you, tell tell us what? Everything he's been talking about for the previous 24 verses in this chapter. Basically, Jesus is about to preach the best sermon of all time. I know you've got your favorite preachers and speakers that you might listen to on podcasts or YouTube, but there is nothing quite like this message that Jesus preached. And this wasn't a message that he spent days preparing. It wasn't a message that he had behind a lectern like me. The Bible says in the beginning of this, he goes to this mountaintop and he literally sits down. The Bible even says he sits down and begins to talk to his disciples. Who are his disciples? His disciples were his friends, his friends who had made a decision to follow him. And Jesus just was chatting about life. That is what this sermon is. He's just chatting. Everybody say chatting about life. That's what Jesus does. And he's telling the disciples, this, is my, this might be where you are living now. But if you can put this message into practice, your life can look very different. You might be sitting here now, but you'll be standing somewhere else as a result of the word that I'm about to speak to you as Jesus just sits down and talks and chats life with them. He says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. Don't worry about your body. Mm. Mm. Or what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes, rock nations? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own You might think first night of Rock Nation, surely the message is about faith. Surely it's like going to stir us up. And by the end, it will. But what Jesus is speaking about is something that all of us in here have to deal with. It is the word worry. Can we all say worry? Worry. I'm not great at pronouncing my R's, and so I end up saying worry. But it's worry. (laughs) Worry. Jesus is speaking about worry. He's asking and he's saying You are worrying far too much 
about what you eat, about what you're going to drink, and about what you're going to wear. And when I, when, I, when I read this, and I've read this many times in my life, I've always gone, Jesus, if, 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 if you really wanted to help our generation, surely you could help us understand some things that we worry about now, because I'm not sure we, we worry about the food we're going to have and the drink we're going to have and the clothes we're going to wear. I'm like, well, what? that's a bit weird that you'd say that. Why is that so significant? And, 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 and at Rock Nations, we go a little bit deep. Is that okay? We don't live in the shallow waters. We live in the deep. We, we go in the shallow and then the deep. Okay. But the Bible says that Jesus says these things. And I'm like, it's strange. But at the time that Jesus says it, there is a king, Caesar Augustus. And he rules the land with fear. He rules the land by holding back the food, holding back drink, holding back clothing. It is under his control because he knows if it's under my control, then the population, the citizens of my kingdom will fear me. And as a result, they will obey me. There is an insecurity in Caesar Augustus that says, if I can hold this stuff back, then I can control my citizens. And so the people are worried because food is rationed. Drink and clothing is, in, is, is rationed. We now have an abundance of it. And so we don't fully understand what this is talking about. But yet the king's tactics is to keep his citizens in constant anxiety. That every morning the dad would wake up worried about what he's going to feed his kids. That every week there'd be a concern about, are we going to have enough drink for our family? What are we going to be able to clothe ourselves in? Because if people are anxious about their life, then they live in fear of the king. And anxiety and fear keeps them in their place and keeps the kingship firm. But you need to know Jesus is the total opposite of Caesar Augustus. He doesn't rule through fear and anxiety. He rules through love and he rules through grace. The Bible says he did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. Did you know anxiety robs so much in young people's lives? In fact, a recent statistic in the United Kingdom says maybe up to 20% of teenagers deal with anxiety. That 20% of teenagers suffer with fear and suffer with anxiety. And you need to know in here tonight, Jesus does not want you anxious. Jesus is not insecure where he needs to keep you in a place of fear so that, we are, so that we serve him out of a place of fear. Yes, the Bible says fear God and be reverent of him in honor and love and respect, but not in the fear of worry about where our next food is coming from or what God is going to do with our life. He does not secure his kingdom by cultivating anxiety, but the opposite, the aim of God's kingship is to free us from anxiety. God does not need you anxious. God does not need you fearful in order to establish his power. Instead, he exalts his power and he exalts his superiority by working to take away anxiety. So as he is sat on a rock talking to his disciples who were under the reign of King Caesar, they are also now understanding, man, another king has come to town. And I like what this king is saying. And there is this conflict between one king over here and his kingdom and another king over here sitting down with us on a rock and his kingdom. And I was thinking about it 2,000 years ago. Jesus is speaking to them about how the people are worried about food and clothing. And the moment I go, I said, it's a bit weird how Jesus would say that. But the more I thought about it, I began to realize that even in 2017, what are many of us worried about? <laughs> food and clothing. <laughs> that food and clothing 2,000 years later, let's be honest, it is still a cause of anxiety and can still be a cause of fear for many of us. Not necessarily in the same way that they experienced it in their, in their time because they're worried about if they're actually going to get it. We don't actually have a fear in our Western world, in our United Kingdom or European world about if we're going to get it. Because in our car park tonight, you can have 
roast chicken, you can have burgers, you can have hot dogs, you can have burritos, you can have ice cream, you can have sandwiches. There is an abundance of food on this campus alone. You walk five minutes down the road, you have KFC, you have McDonald's, you can have a zinger, you can have a six piece or an eight piece, or you can have a bargain bucket, you can have a subway, you can have a pasty from Greg's, you can have whatever you want, whenever you want it. There is not a shortage of food, but yet many of you still live with an anxiety about food. And, and I don't have necessarily an anxiety about how I'm going to get it, but I still live with a little bit of an anxiety about how I'm going to eat it. <laughs> I have this ability to spill food all the time. I sometimes think I need to wear a bib again. You know one of those bibs that kids wear that have like a little loop on it? I'm like, that would really help me. Because then once all the, half the meal is in that little thing, when you, you, you've eaten your meal, you just, you just eat what's left. And I think my fear comes back to when I, my first ever job, I was, a, I was wait, as a waiter and I was asked to go and do silver service waiting. That's next level. It's not Pizza Hut waiting where they just shove your pizza on your table and walk away. Silver service waiting is where you have a fork and you have a spoon and you have to delicately use your fingers to use them together to make like prong kind of things where you pick up individual pieces of chicken and put them on someone's plate as they're sat down. You then pick up the potatoes and put them on. But you can't just use a spoon and, and you know, dollop it on the plate. Silver service is a high level way of waiting on executives. And then the first time I was ever asked to do this, I wasn't trained to do it. I was sent to the Millennium Stadium in Wales for the opening of the rugby stadium. And I was asked to look after three tables and to serve them their food. No training, no idea how to hold these things. And so I'm, I'm just doing my best. I'm like, I'm not doing a very good job. I think I'll give it a shot. I'm confident. And so I go to the table and trying to get this chicken out of this tray. And it's just not really working. And anyway, I, I sort of managed to like hook it. <laughs> And like, you know, though, when you go to like an amusement place and you put a pound in, and it's like just hanging there and on the ear and then it just drops. It's a similar thing. I had this chicken and just as I'm about to put it on this lady's plate, it, um, she's talking to her friend and, and the, the chicken breast of red, of red wine sauce falls down her white blouse. Down the back of her white blouse just... No, 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 no. <laughs> EastEnders, we ain't got time for that. Red wine everywhere. Dirty chicken breasts with carpet hair just sat somewhere under the chair. Some of you are like, I'd have it still. <laughs> Some of you do the three second rule. Some of you do the three minute rule. Some of you do the three day rule. You know what I did? I have a moment to think, what do I do? I've never done this before. I did, I did, I think, the mature thing. I just walked away. <laughs> and I ran to the opposite of the hall, didn't tell anyone, and just started working on some other tables over here, you know, just like, just pretending if I was needed, because I knew they already had waiters, and I just left it. I just ignored it. I never went back. I never know what happened, although I know this lady had a red wine sauce all over her blouse. It haunts me. So much so that recently we went to this to eat some Japanese food and the only, the only cutlery they had was chopsticks. I, I'm not great with chopsticks, but you don't want to be in like a nice Japanese restaurant and say, have you got a fork, please? So we're on this round table and everyone's delicately getting a thing. I'm like, how do I do this thing? And so I, I managed to delicately again, you know, <laughs> pick up this tiny little bit of beef and as I'm bringing it, back to my plate, the thing drops and splashes in a pool of, of like sauce and it all goes everywhere and everyone laughs at me. I'm anxious <laughs> when it comes to serving food. But many of you are still anxious when it comes to eating it. Or what should I eat? I've seen a few Huel t-shirts walking around Rock Nations already. The, the food replacement powdery drinks, whatever they are. And many of you are anxious. There is such a pressure not to eat too much. And then we end up under eating and we're getting into issues with our eating habits. Did you know that up to 20% of teenage girls have challenges when it comes to their eating and are worried about their eating habits? 
7% of teenage males are also worried about their eating habits. And if that is you in this place tonight, we believe Jesus wants to set you free. We are worried about food still. And then I was thinking, clothing, don't tell me you didn't put thought and more thought into what you were going to wear tonight to Rock Nations. I know some of you have been on a bus all day and you've just come here and like you're just in your joggers and you're just in the the t-shirt that's been you've had on the bus for six hours. But some of you have put a little bit more thought into it. In fact, so much thought that you've been on ASOS for the last few months and you've bought bag after bag after bag after bag and you've returned bag after bag after bag. You know you've had them hung up on your door for the last six weeks. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, tribal wars after tribal wars. If it's raining at tribal wars, if I get a muddy leg during tribal wars and you have contingency plans when it comes to your clothing. You want to look good and there's nothing wrong with looking good. But some of you in this place tonight are bowing down to too many King Caesars. You're bowing down to too many of the fears that King Caesar has established on his citizens. And you are locked into a king and a kingdom that is keeping you locked up in fear and anxiety. And yet there is another king over there who is sat on a rock and his kingdom is looking to set you free in Jesus' name. Freedom! Freedom! And in the great words of the theologian of our era, of our, the great theologian of our day, who in his recent Bible commentary of the New Testament, his name is Dizzy Rascal, has a line in one of his songs that says, you're too young to be stressed and depressed. And as so many of us young people, we can live stressed and we can live depressed. And yet tonight, my encouragement is live simple. Seek God. Look for him. Put him first and repeat. Live simple. Look for him. Seek him. Put him first and repeat. Because let me tell you, he has been seeking you out. Jesus has been seeking you. He's been looking for you. He's been putting you first. So I know we're told to seek him and put him first, but you need to know he's not asking you to do something that he's not already done himself. He's been seeking you since creation. He's been putting you first. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, putting you first. It's what he does. And you cannot seek God without first coming to a realization that he has been seeking you. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, a man would leave 99 of his sheep just to go in search of one. He will go just seeking out the one. He is prepared to leave the 99 to go and look for one. When Jesus finds a man called Zacchaeus up a tree, he ignores and forgets about everything else he's doing. He says, young man, come down. We're going to have dinner because the son of man comes to seek and to save those that are lost. Jesus has been seeking you out. And if you feel lost today, if you don't fully know where you are, you know you're in Bradford and you know you're in a church, but you feel in your soul lost, you need to know Jesus has found you. He knows where you are and he desires you to come closer. Isn't it interesting? He says to Zacchaeus, come down. Jesus has gone to him, but now Zacchaeus, come down. He desires a closeness. He desires a relationship with you because the closer you are to him, the further you are away from fear and anxiety. The closer you are to him, the further you are away from the devil's schemes. The closer you are to him, the closer you are to your purpose and your destiny. Jesus says tonight, come closer. Because since the beginning of time, Humanity has had a choice. We're not the only generation. I know sometimes we think we are. We have multiple choices and like we have so many options, our generation. We do, but let's be honest. Every generation has had their own options and every generation has had their own battles. And every generation has had to ask the question, who shall we seek? 
Generation after generation, who shall we speak? Even Joshua, when he leads the Israelites out of Egypt and begins to take them to the promised land and they are faced with battles and opportunities to serve other kings and other kingdoms. Joshua stands up and he says, I don't know who you're going to serve. I don't know what king and kingdom you're going to bow down to. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to seek the kingdom of God. And you need some same Joshua attitude in your life and in your house that says, hey, I don't know about you, but as for me, God's in first place. God's in first place. Because did you know God doesn't do second? God cannot do second. He literally cannot do it. The Bible says God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. That is true. Why? Because if God says a lie, as soon as he says it, it immediately becomes true. As he declares his word, God can't say this is a white t-shirt. Because as soon as he says this is a white t-shirt, guess what? This becomes a white t-shirt. God cannot lie and God cannot do second. The first commandment in the Bible that God gives to Moses, the first one, it says, There shall be no other gods before me. Not because God is like insecure, but because to be second, you have to be following something else in first place. And God is an awesome leader, but he is a very poor follower. God doesn't follow. God leads. There shall be no other gods before me. It is why he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. He says, I am the one who is and who was and who is to come. The Lord Almighty. What is God saying? God is saying, I was first. I am first, and you need to know, I will be first. (laughs) That no one else is ever going to get in front of me. I am the sovereign God. I am all sufficient, omnipotent God, the almighty God. It is the principle of first. God wants to be first. What happens when it comes to our Giving, what does the Bible teach? When we get income into our lives, the Bible, if you've been in church, I'm sure your pastor teaches you to, to, to get wise and to get good with your generosity, to put God first. And so we give the first 10% of our income to God. We, we put him first. What happens when we worship? We worship God first. What we do when, it, when we go to church on a Sunday, Sunday is the first day of the week. There's a reason why you go to church, because you're given a portion of your week to him first. Why? Because God is first. And if God is first, then everything else will come into order. If you have a top button on your shirt, and if God is first on the top button, it's amazing how every other button will get into order. But if you get the top button wrong, it's amazing how the shirt feels disjointed and out of place, and your life can feel confused and a little bit at an angle. Why? Because God is not in first place. And the reason there is often disorder in our lives, even though God is first on this planet, first in this universe, He is the sovereign God. Sometimes we make a choice in our own life to have Him second, to have Him third, to have Him fifth, to have Him seventh. And instead of seeking Him first, Jesus is saying here, other kings and other kingdoms are nestling in for first place. You've got a decision to make. And tonight on this opening night of Rock Nations, are there other kings and are there other kingdoms that are nestling in for first place? Because I tell you what happens is we start seeking other stuff. I've been following God a long time and I can still seek other stuff. We can all seek other stuff. Youth pastors in here, we can seek other stuff. We don't always put God first on a daily basis. I know that's what we should do and we can preach it. But if we're honest, other things creep in. Other things begin to nestle in. And I have to ask myself, is what I'm seeking sustaining me or is it starving me? Because as Jesus is sat on this well with a lady and she's been seeking man after man, She's been seeking relationship after relationship. He begins to realize, man, you're sat on this well, and because I'm not first in your life, guess what? You will always thirst. 
And if he's not first in your life, there will always be this thirst for more. There will always be this thirst for stuff and another husband and another husband. And Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water in this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them, they will never thirst. This lady needed Jesus. And if you seek after the wrong stuff consistently, it will leave you empty. It will leave you empty and maybe some of you have come here tonight on this opening night and you feel empty. You feel sort of dry. You feel sort of just void of any spiritual activity. In the worship, it's like it's electric in here and you feel like numb to it. Your friends are like going mad for it and you just feel, I just don't feel anything. Can I encourage you? Let's start thirsting for Jesus. Just have a a taste for Jesus. And you begin to see what change that will make in your life. Because if you keep thirsty for the wrong stuff, it will leave you empty. And only God provides you with the fuel that you need for your future. But if we are honest, we go seeking all the time. We go seeking at home, we go seeking at school, we go seeking in our communities. And sometimes we go seeking going, where can I find significance? Everyone else seems to be gaining in significance, but where can, I, where can I gain in significance? Where could I find some significance? I'll go seeking over here. Oh, oh brilliant, brilliant. I, I, found some, I found some significance. If Sam wants to join me tonight on the stage, just play keys. I found some significance, guys. I've, I've got it. <laughs> this is what I need. Sam, this is what I need. I've got it, man. <laughs> significance. Come on, that's what I want. And sometimes we base our life on significance, which, which looks like, you know, I, I want to be known and I want people to know me. And my Instagram followers, man, they're plateauing. It's not following the growth chart that I created. I've stayed at 230 for too long. In fact, I've lost 30 in a day because there were some Chinese robots following me. I didn't even know who they were. And now they've disappeared. I'm like, what's happened with all of those? followers that I had they, they were like they were I thought they were real people and now I found out they weren't real people they were just fake computers somewhere and now my followers are down and my significance is down and people don't know me like I want to be known and I want my life to amount to something I, I don't want to be a nobody and the reality is if you seek significance long enough chances are you'll probably find it and once I've got significance I, I, I now I want security now where can I find security? Security. Oh, yes. I need security, man. I need security in my life. Every teenager is looking for security. If I can just be secure, then security would really help me. Like that friendship. If I can get in that group, that group will change everything. Where won't I get laughed at? If, if I hang out with them, that's where I won't get laughed at. You know, my parents have recently divorced and, and I feel alone and, and I feel scared and, and they are natural feelings. But like, who's going to help me you know, if I get stuck? And, and if I seek long enough, the chances are I will probably find security if I seek for it long enough. And now I've got this, but now I'm looking for other things. And now I'd really love a little bit of intimacy. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, I found it. I found it. And I, don't really, I don't really like her, to be honest, but I just need some intimacy. It's not really my kind of girl, and, but it's, I, need some, I need someone to look me in the eye and smile at me. I need, I'm 15 and I've never been kissed. I'm like, I need some intimacy. and I need someone to send me a Snapchat of some love heart. I need, I need some form of intimacy I want to know what it feels like to be loved and pursued and you'll do for now (laughs) just want some just want some intimacy man and now I've got this now I'm starting I'm on a roll and now like I I, I want a better phone I want a better phone like I'm I'm on like an iPhone 5 and it's got a cracked screen I'm like I need better. I'm using one of those old chargers. I'm like, it's embarrassing. You know, have you got an old charger? I need, I need a new phone. I need some new stuff. And if I can just go and search for some, some possessions. and oh, oh, possessions. I found possessions. Sweet. 
I love possession. I need a new phone. I need a new camera. I need some new clothes. If I seek long enough, the chances are then I might find some possessions. And once I've got this, then I'm going looking. I'm on a roll now. And I'm going to go seeking out acceptance. And can I find acceptance? Yes, I found acceptance. They'll, they'll accept me for who I am. I just want to fit in and blend in. I just don't want to stand out. And I know I'm not really who God's called, who, I, who I'm being, who God's created me to be, but I need to sacrifice some of that stuff. Why? Because I just need to fit in. I just need to be accepted. And I don't want to stand out. Please don't. I'd, please, please don't let me stand out. I don't even like these jeans, but everyone else wears these jeans. So I feel I have to wear these jeans. I don't even like this hair, but everyone has their hair like this. So I have to have my hair like this. I don't even like this band, but I'm finding myself in a mosh pit listening to a band I don't even like. Why? Because I want to be accepted. I don't even like Little Mix, but all my friends like Little Mix. And if I seek long enough, chances are I'll probably find it. And once I've got this, I'd love some approval, you know. Full on love it if I could just get some approval. And, and now I'm struggling because like I'm beginning to hold quite a few things. So I'm just going to put some over there. And I'm just going to put my possessions over there and get, take, go and get them. But, oh yes, I've got approval. Just somebody to tell me I'm doing all right. Just somebody to, my friend or a parent or a leader, just someone to say I'm good. Just someone to think positively about me. And if I seek long enough for approval, chances are I'll probably find approval and I can add it to everything else. And, uh, uh, but I really need some cash. And if I can just go in search of money, I, re I really want some money. And now I've got money. <laughs> and my approval's been kicked around a little bit, but it's all good. Like, I need some money. I've got to buy some new stuff. I can't keep wearing this same stuff. I need some new dollar. Or what I heard last week as a youth pastor, if you want to be balling, like I, I need to be, I need to be balling with the cash. Because <laughs> money will give me options and money makes me popular and money shows what I have. And the chances are, the chances are if I seek money long enough, I'll probably find it. I could sacrifice going to church on a Sunday to get a little job paying $3.50 an hour. It's worth it. I stopped going to youth on a Friday night just for a few extra quid. It's worth it. Why? Because I seek some stuff. I'm seeking some money. I want what you've got and I can't afford it, but I'm going to get it. And if I seek long enough, chances are I'll probably find it. And final thing I go in search for tonight that I'm seeking just my dreams. I'd love my dreams to be fulfilled. I've got, a, I've got a dream to be a footballer. I've got a dream to be a movie star. I've got a dream to be a geologist. I've got a dream to be a science teacher. I've got this dream and I'll do whatever it takes to get that dream. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll work harder and harder. I'll strive more and more. I'll move anywhere I need to move. I'll go with anyone as long as I can fulfill my dreams and get my possessions and sort out my approval and my acceptance. And, and, and I've got all of this stuff and the chances are if I seek long enough, chances are you'll probably find it. But sometimes I can gain the whole world and yet lose my soul. And the reality is I can't seek all of these things and hold them. I don't have the capacity, the ability to hold all of this stuff. I literally cannot do it. And I end up dropping them. And then I end up having broken dreams. And then I end up dropping the, my possessions. And, and before I know it, I've, I, I've got my new things and it's broken and I need to get something new again. I can't hold all of these things. And it comes to a point where I just drop them. But if I choose to seek first the kingdom of God, so I can't do this anymore. I can't keep seeking all this stuff anymore. But if I can just go seeking for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom of God. I'll do whatever it takes. Find where's the kingdom of God? What's this? I'll find the kingdom of God. I'll find the kingdom of God. I think I might have found the kingdom of God. I think I might have found the kingdom of God. And, and here I have the, the, the kingdom of God. I think I'm finding it, but... 
let me, let's see what happens when I, when I make a decision with the kingdom of God. And I want to I wanna see what's in the kingdom of God. And as I open up the kingdom, of, oh my, I found significance in the kingdom of God. And I, I found some acceptance in the kingdom of God. And I found some dreams in the kingdom of God. And intimacy, I found it in the kingdom of God. And security, I found. And approval, I found. And possessions, God's even graced me with. And money's starting to come in my life. And it's all found in the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added. Shall be added. Shall be added. Shall be added unto you. The reality is seeking God is enough by itself. If I opened that suitcase and it was empty, guess what? Still enough. God's enough for me. I don't even need any more, but he is gracious and he is kind enough to give you some of these things in addition to seeking first the kingdom of God. (laughs) When you seek God first, he never leaves you second because in him, I find all I need. As Hebrews 11 says, he earnestly, he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And at the age of 12 in my life, playing football, it's all I ever wanted to do. I just want to play football. I want to make it in football. I'll do what it takes, man, to make it in football. And come to the age of 12 and someone says, we want you in our team, but it's Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. And I'm like, oh, I know now we're blessed to have services and multiple options at 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 7 o'clock. And many of you churches might not have that luxury, but I'm thankful that churches have now become a little bit more, you know, expressive with their times. But when I was 12, it was 10.30 and that's it. 10.30 and you've missed it for seven days. And I remember going, I'm speaking to my parents and they're saying, well, it's football if you want to do it, you know, you can do it. But we think the best thing for you to do would be to seek first the kingdom of God. And I remember at the age of 12 making a decision, I'm not going to play football anymore at that time. If you really want me, then I'll play another time. But I'm not going to play 10.30 on Sunday morning. I remember when I was 15 years old and friendships were coming into my life and they were cool friendship, man. I was beginning to gain in popularity, beginning to get a little bit more known and accepted and approved and recognized. And, but I just knew something wasn't right. I had to make a decision to lay some of those friends down and what seek first the kingdom of God. I remember being at 19, going to university and some things become a little bit appealing. You start, start seeking some other stuff and things happen and then you actually realize, no, there's nothing quite like seeking first the kingdom of God. And I wasn't perfect. I wasn't perfect. I made mistakes along the way and I still make mistakes now in what I can seek. But I had a choice to make every day, who will I seek? I simply made a decision. Put God first. It's easy to seek the kingdom of God till another kingdom comes along. But when the other kingdom comes along, you have to make the decision, which kingdom will you seek? I have to choose to seek first the kingdom of God. 